Michelle, you have me on video mute, right? No. Okay, so let me take myself off video mute. Okay. There you go. We're going to get started in just a moment. We have a few people logging on right now. Mm -hmm. So go ahead and get started. All right. Welcome to Holocaust Museum Houston's first lecture of the 2020 Virtual Latinx Heritage Month Lecture and Film Series. My name is Dr. Michelle Tovar and I'm Associate Director of Education Latino Initiatives here at the museum. We would like to thank our partner Global Speak Translation Services for interpreting our upcoming lectures and films. Tonight's event unfortunately will not be interpreted into Spanish but will be recorded and accessible to the museum's YouTube channel. Holocaust Museum Houston stands in solidarity with the Black community and recognizes the importance of the Black Lives Matter movement. I would like to take a moment to remember and say the names of those recently murdered by police violence. Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Elijah McCain, Nicholas Chavez, survivor Jacob Blake, and the many other unnamed Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and trans lives who have suffered injustice. Please submit your questions in the Q&A box and we will try to get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. Dr. Paul Ortiz is Professor of History and the Director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida. He is the author of Emancipation Betrayed, The Hidden History of Black Organizing and White Violence from Reconstruction to the Bloody Election of 1920 and co-editor of the oral history, Remembering Jim Crow, African Americans Tell About the Life in the Segregated South. His book, An African American and Latinx History of the United States, received the 2018 Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Award for Literary, Literary Excellence. Professor Ortiz teaches undergraduate courses and supervises graduate fields in African American history, Latina, Latino, Latinx history, comparative ethnic studies, U.S. South, labor, social movement theory, and oral history, digital humanities, and other topics. He is also faculty advisor for the UF Dream Defenders, Por Colombia, Chispas, Students for Bernie, and many other student organizations. In 2013, he received the Cesar E. Chavez Action and Commitment Award from Florida Education Association, AFL-CIO. Without further ado, welcome Dr. Paul Ortiz. Thank you so much, Michelle, for the kind introduction. And first of all, I just want to thank Holocaust Museum Houston for the invitation. It's a great honor for me personally to be able to join you in this important time of Black Lives Matter and Hispanic Heritage Month, Latinx Heritage Month. And it's such an amazing time to do history. Um, this is like a homecoming for me because my father and uh, much of my family actually grew up in Houston. Um, my family, my, my grandfather's generation uh, were refugees, political refugees, uh, who fled from Mexico in the middle of a very bloody revolution that cost uh, nearly two million lives. And uh, my father was actually uh, born and raised uh, primarily in Houston, Texas. I have a lot of family. Um, we have my, my great grandmother's uh, home. Uh, we still own that in Vance Street. It's a very sacred place for our family. So I just want to send a, a shout out to my father, Paul Pedro or Ortiz, who's actually um, joining us uh, this evening. Hey, Dad. Um, would have loved to join you in person at, at home, but um, you know, uh, we'll do it after the pandemic. But it is such an amazing uh, time to do history, uh, is it not? And when we think about um, the idea of Black Lives Matter, um, when we think about 
Latinx Heritage Month, or what we call in Florida Hispanic Heritage Month. What I want to do tonight is to share with you um, some kind of glimpses into my latest book, um, as Michelle mentioned, an African American and Latinx history of the United States. And I'm going to uh, show some slides and kind of talk to you about the book, how it fits in with this theme um, of Hispanic Heritage Month. And basically what I'm trying to do is really trying to place uh, Latinos, Chicanos, Mexicanos, and African Americans at the center of US history where we've always belonged, but where we have often been marginalized. And the argument here is that from the very beginning, the United States has been part of the entire Americas. And our peoples um, have provided the labor, the politics, the, the intellectual um, uh, capacities, and that we have nothing to be ashamed of, that we have given to this country much more than we have taken uh, collectively, um, and that we have so much to learn from the rest of the world, where our ancestors, in fact, came from. And you'll note right away, I begin with the Haitian Revolution. It's in chapter one. And the book really begins in around the time of the American Revolution. Um, I go on to talk about the Mexican War of Independence. And I'll talk a little more about the Mexican War of Independence, but um, that war is such an important war for this country, for the United States. The Mexican War of Independence is the first um, of the independence wars after the Haitian Revolution, which fights for the abolition of slavery. The Mexican War of Independence also fights for the abolition of the oppression of indigenous people in the Americas. And African Americans in the United States look with tremendous hope uh, on the Mexican War of Independence, which was fought from 1810 to 1821. And of course, this evening, uh, even as we speak in Mexico City and other parts of Mexico, uh, there are bells being rung. Um, there's a lot of joy uh, in the streets. Uh, it's a tremendous moment in world history. It's a breakthrough. Um, and because the Mexican people did something in 1810 that the American Revolution could not do, and that is come to grips with slavery and come up with a plan to abolish slavery. Um, I won't go over the entire book, uh, but I want to uh, address your attention to chapter four. Uh, the Cuban Solidarity Movement. Um, and that movement was a movement of African Americans who forged bonds of solidarity with brothers and sisters in Cuba who were fighting Spanish oppression in the 1800s and trying to provide support to the Cuban War liberation against Spanish imperialism. And so you, you kind of see the theme here. This is uh, replacing a static view of history with a social movement focus with a focus about the roles that our ancestors of black and brown people played in the liberation of people in this hemisphere. Um, let me, because I am talking to you live from Florida, uh, we're a Disney state, we're gonna go on a roller coaster ride of history this evening. And I wanna talk, start by talking about the present and where we are now. Uh, and the moment that we're in now is a moment where increasingly uh, immigrant workers, African-American, Latina, Asian-American women are playing uh, increasingly important roles in the United States. And my last chapter in the book, chapter eight, was a really fun chapter to write because I got to write about things like the 2006 general strike uh, in which many of my students participated in. Uh, as organizers, uh, and that general strike was called primarily by Hispano, Mexicano, Latinx workers, and it was really a national strike against racism. And uh, many other people other than Hispanics, of course, participated in that march. It's really the largest general strike in American history. The argument in chapter eight is that it's really Latinos in concert with African-Americans who make it possible to elect the first African-American president in US history. And it's Latino ballots in places like Las Vegas and Los Angeles and Sacramento and Seattle, which helped put President Obama over the top. And so chapter eight is really um, uh, part of that argument. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. plays a really important role in this book. And you see on the right, uh, Dolores Huerta, 
the co-founder of the United Farm Worker Union, uh, 90 years young, uh, uh, as active as ever, uh, an ardent feminist, an ardent labor organizer, uh, an ardent political activist. And what I want to point your attention to is this journal, El Macriado. Those who speak Spanish know that this uh, means the troublemaker, literally, a person raised with, with, with bad manners, okay? The Farm Worker Union uh, of the 60s uh, used, chose that title quite purposefully because they wanted to remind people that they were fighting the status quo. Uh, they were not going to be satisfied with Mexican American farm workers being paid poverty and starvation wages. Uh, so they were, they were gonna cause some trouble about it. But when Dr. King was assassinated, the farm worker movement, and you have to kind of remember the farm worker movement of the 60s was composed primarily of, you know, yes, Mexican American farm workers, but also Haitian farm workers, uh, African Americans, uh, poor whites, and especially Filipino farm workers as well. So this is the first journal that really interprets Dr. King's life and death as a working class story. And that's a big theme in my book is that US history is not a middle class history. It's a working class history. It's a social movement history. It's a history of working people in struggle. And what the farm worker movement is trying to say in their depiction of Dr. King, and this whole journal, by the way, it's several pages long, and you can download this, by the way, um, it's on the internet. Um, the whole journal is designed to remind us that Dr. King died, he was killed, helping workers to organize, helping poor people to, to abolish poverty. And in the journal, when you read it, it frames Dr. King as an anti-imperial leader as well. It talks about how he connected the struggle against poverty in the United States with the Vietnam War. Uh, for example, he says, why should we be recruiting young black and brown youth to go and fight poor Vietnamese villagers in Vietnam and then tell them, oh, be nonviolent, right? There's kind of a contradiction there. So Dr. King plays a really important role in this book. So I went to the 60s, back to 1968, and now we're closer to the president again. And this is a wonderful story. I'm not going to read this, uh, read the panels, because um, if I read the panels, you wouldn't have to buy the book, right? Um, but this, I like this story because it's a story that involves some of my former students who became labor organizers in the early 2000s. And they went to organize in a place called Smithfield Poultry. And many of you during the pandemic uh, have been, who have been following the outbreak of COVID in some of the big meat packing plants in the Midwest will know the name of Smithfield Foods. Now, these are plants in Eastern North Carolina. And the story here is that hundreds of, of in this case, primarily Latinx uh, uh, meat packing workers actually went to their supervisors. Uh, and they said, we want the right to celebrate Martin Luther King's birthday. And you know, not just as a holiday to go off and, and have a picnic, we're gonna hold educational events about Dr. King. And the response of their predominantly Anglo supervisors was, y'all don't know anything about Dr. King. You know, you're, you're, you're Mexicans or Central Americans or Hondurans or whatever. And the response of the workers illuminates a very important theme in American history. Their response was, well, it seems to us that we immigrants know more about Dr. King than you supervisors and you people in management. We know that he lived and died for people like us, regardless of whether we were in the United States or in Latin America or the Caribbean. And so they, they literally went on strike, y'all, for the right to celebrate Dr. King's birthday. And I'll just quote uh, Eduardo Benia at the end, you know, we've got Latino workers here ready to walk out for the holiday. I hear them saying things like, people assume that we don't know who King was, his struggle was the same struggle we're going through now. And this was a struggle to really be proud of. It ended in a successful union campaign, union organizing drive. Um, I talk a lot in chapter eight about the role that Latinos have played in the remaking of American politics uh, in recent years. You look at the women in the forefront uh, and, and, and this is the new labor movement. This is a labor movement led by Latinas, African-American women, uh, Asian American women, women from you know immigrant women, women from all of the nations of the planet, and you see a professor there in the background who's in the back, and that's and that's where he belongs because women now are really in the forefront 
of this movement. Flashing back to the 19th century, African-Americans support the Cuban Liberation War. They support the Mexican War of Independence. And here, Reverend Lena Mason is trying to break it down for her audience, and she's writing in 1899. Reverend Lena Mason was one of the foremost African-American evangelists of her time. And she's trying here to, to depict the, cur the courage of Cuban-American women in the Cuban liberation struggle. She's saying, you know, these women are not stay-at-home women. They're, they actually, they've learned how, how to pick up guns, uh, machetes, uh, they're marching with men, they're fighting the Spanish imperialists, um, and uh, they're gonna win. And it's really a striking thing to look at black newspapers in the 1800s and to see how much black newspapers were writing about um, uh, struggles in Latin America and in the Caribbean. Um, the book is also rooted in my personal experiences. So I grew up, I'm a first-gen college student, but back in the day, growing up in shipyard towns and military towns, you know, no one told us about college. Um, I was told basically college wasn't for me. Uh, my um, high school counselor wouldn't even talk to me about college. Uh, so I did go into the military. I'm a third-generation military veteran. Um, I was stationed uh, for two years in Latin America. Um, I was in uh, Venezuela, uh, uh, Honduras, uh, Colombia, uh, all over the place. And so leaving the United States for me was very important. And leaving the U.S. In, in, at the age of 20, um, I came to realize that, you know, I, people in the region started talking to me. You know, they, they would ask me, well, you know, what are y'all doing here? You know, what, what is the U.S. military doing in Colombia uh, and, and, and Honduras and Venezuela? And I realized after a time, I didn't have a good answer. You know, I had the answer I was given as a soldier in special forces. You know, I was training people in pistol techniques and communication. That picture of me in the lower left is I've just come from the international airport in Bogota and I picked up a shipment of sniper rifles and I'm taking an inventory of sniper rifles. And I kind of thought I knew what I was doing. You know, I was this young paratrooper, sergeant in special forces, you know, really macho kind of character, um, but, it took people from the region to ask me these, these basic questions. You know, why is the U.S. here? Uh, what do you guys think you're doing in our country? Uh, when are you going to leave? And I realized at a later point, I was a soldier of imperialism. And that became one of the major topics that I ended up writing about in the book. So the book is very personal for me. It is based in part on personal experiences. But it's also, I want people reading U.S. history to try to understand what it's like to, to experience our country from the outside. You know, what it's like for someone raised in Southern Honduras to think about the United States. Um, the, the image that the U.S. has at home of a democracy, of a beacon of, of freedom, is not necessarily the image um, that we've earned uh, uh, overseas, especially in, in the Global South. So this is the, the signage, and I apologize, this is very hurtful, um, it's shocking, but, but, but this is the, the, the stuff that my father and his generation had to survive in order to raise us in a later generation. These horrific signs, no Negroes, no dogs, no Mexicans allowed. And it's just a reminder that racism in this country, white supremacy, uh, was pervasive. And how do we reach a point where we can go to college where we can actually have something approaching equality. Uh, wasn't thanks to the founding fathers, because as I talk about in chapter one, people like Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, never imagined that people like you and I would go to college. They never imagined that people like you and I would even have the right to vote. Their image of us and their plan for people like me and you was for us to be workers and to have minimal rights, just enough rights uh, essentially to make money for people like the Virginia planters or the, the great Texas ranchers, right? Um, so where do we get these rights from, right? And, and that's a big theme of the book is the generations of struggles. You know, so you'll see Dolores Huerta, you'll see Dr. King, you'll see Cesar Chavez, uh, but you'll also see the great revolutionaries of Central America, uh, uh, Augusto Sandino, uh, Jose Maria Morelos from Texas, right? Or I'm sorry, from Mexico. 
so the comparisons between African American and Latino histories are really remarkable. And I'll just glance over these tonight. We can talk more about them in Q&A. Langston Hughes writes, one of the great poems in American history, The Negro Speaks of Rivers, as he's taking a train into Mexico. Langston Hughes is a great African-American poet, right? But his father is a successful black businessman in Mexico. And Langston is on his way to Mexico. And he writes this incredible poem as he's crossing the, the boundary between the United States and Mexico. And this poem becomes one of the greatest poems in American history. Um, Elizabeth Catlett on the left um, is a great African-American sculptress and an artist, one of the greatest artists of the 20th century, but she's driven out of the United States in the 1940s because of her radical politics, and she becomes an icon in Mexican art. And I want to emphasize for you the importance of the Mexican public arts tradition. Generations of African-American artists, including people like Jacob Lawrence, go to Mexico or learn from Mexican public artists, people like Freda Kahlo, people like Diego Rivera. Um, and, and in fact, those of you who are taking U.S. history and have heard of a thing called the, the uh, Works Progress Administration um, or the New Deal um, will learn eventually that it's the Mexican public arts tradition which really um, allows people in the United States to create the WPA this idea about public murals, public art. Art shouldn't just be in, 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 in museums. It should be out of doors, right? So Haiti is really the linchpin of this entire book, The Haitian Revolution, which starts in 1791. Haiti earns its independence in 1804 after defeating two French expeditionary forces, armies defeating the Spanish uh, invasion army, defeating a French invasion army. And Haiti is really the key delivery because all the subsequent freedom movements in Latin America key on Haiti. What I mean by this is that people like Simon Bolivar and but later Jose Marti, Antonio Maceo from Cuba, right, um, all go to Haiti when they're driven out of their respective countries by the Spanish. The Haitians provide sanctuary for the region's freedom fighters. Uh, the Haitians actually provide support for the Mexican War of Independence. Um, the Haitians are seen by oppressed people everywhere in this hemisphere as the beacon of liberty. And the mainstream history texts don't want you to know that because the European imperial powers and the United States literally put a stranglehold on Haiti after Haiti won its independence because they wanted to separate Haiti from the rest of the hemisphere. And they wanted to try to convince people that Haiti was a impoverished country. Um, there wasn't anything good happening there. But if you're an oppressed person, or if you're one of the greatest Americans of all time, like Frederick Douglass, who gives a speech, actually that's a misprint, not in 1983, but in, in 1893, Frederick Doug Douglass gives a speech in Chicago. And he says that we owe the most to the Haitians for our freedom here in the United States. Uh, and that's a really remarkable statement. Um, the first Venezuelan flag is flown not in Venezuela, it's flown in Haiti. Because again, the freedom fighters, people like Simon Bolivar, are driven out of, um, of Central America, end up going to, ha to Haiti for sanctuary and to learn military tactics because the Haitians are the only country in the hemisphere that have defeated three different imperial armies, right? Uh, and so this is why the, the, the national flag of Venezuela is flown first in Haiti uh, and not in Venezuela. If they had tried to fly it in Venezuela, the Spanish would have taken them out, right? But the 20th century, Haiti continues to provide this incredible beacon of liberty and freedom. And I don't have a lot of time to talk about this part, but the Evian Conference and Political Refugees, uh, you know, which I know that the Holocaust Museum in Houston has resources on, this is an incredible moment in, in world history, all. This is right at the eve of World War II. And the United States and France and the other Western democracies are refusing to lift their uh, quotas uh, and, and they're refusing to welcome uh, Jewish refugees by and large into their nations. Well, who steps to the fore? Haiti steps to the fore. The Dominican Republic, Mexico, you know, nations that don't have a lot of resources are saying, if we only had more resources, we would welcome 
Jewish refugees into our country. And in fact, in the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, which I direct at the University of Florida, we have interviews, uh, almost 100 oral history interviews of, of Jewish people who were able to um, either flee Nazi Germany and resettle in El Salvador. And so that San Salvador had a thriving Jewish community, but it was done by the, uh, the desire and willingness of people in Central America to welcome in Jewish refugees at the time when countries like the United States, France, Great Britain, so on and so forth, were refusing to do so. Now, you may ask, how did I find out about all this stuff? Uh, quite by accident. Uh, so I was reading this, uh, a Jewish newspaper um, and that was published in Canada called the Jewish Tribune. And I was going through these 1960s and 70s and 80s um, articles, and I found out that there was a day that um, the Jewish Tribune and its readers actually celebrated, and they commemorate this day to actually pay honor to, uh, to the Republic of Haiti uh, for its willingness to try to accept Jewish refugees. Now, that plan was blocked in, the, in, in 1938 by the U.S., unfortunately, but Haiti was still able to provide some Jewish refugees with sanctuary. It's an incredible moment in world history, but again, probably one you didn't learn about uh, because unfortunately, again, the mainstream history textbooks um, uh, cast a lot of shade uh, on the histories of Haiti, Mexico, the Dominican Republic, uh, you know, Latin America. And the idea that they often give us is that, you know, those of us whose ancestors come from any of those countries have to come to the U.S. and assimilate and have to come to the U.S. to learn about things like democracy or human rights, which is ridiculous. Because if you think about the United States, most of, of the history of this country is a history of slavery. It's a history of segregation. It's a history of Jim Crow. If you think about the history of Europe, it's a history of imperialism, of colonialism, uh, of apartheid. And one of the favorite organizations that I talk about in, in, in my last chapter of the book is a group called Latinos Against Apartheid. And it was founded by a group of Puerto Rican community organizers in, um, in New York, including a congressman. Uh, and my dear friend and elder and guide, Howard Jordan, who's a leader of the Puerto Rican community in the Bronx, um, actually was one of the founders of that organization. Think about Puerto Ricans uh, against apartheid. And we too often are taught to look to Europe or to look to um, you know, the founding fathers for our beacons, our guides, but in fact, our ancestors and our elders and our families, you know, our grandparents, our great grandparents were really the ones that were fighting these incredible democracy battles at the same time that the Europeans were exporting imperialism, colonialism, apartheid, so on and so forth. I mentioned the Mexican War of Independence and its profound importance. We have to understand that as we celebrate the outbreak of the Mexican War of Independence this very week, and again, I want to think about what we're doing tonight as part of an international celebration. Uh, there are people right now, I know Mexico is celebrating this, this incredible day. Um, we have to, to acknowledge that the Mexican War of Independence begins in a much higher plane in terms of human rights than the American Revolution was able to do. If you think about the American Revolution, um, by the time that the American Revolution started um, in the early 1770s, the anti-slavery movement was already over a century old. And there were many people in the, United, in the 13 colonies who argued that the American Revolution should be a war against slavery as much as it was a war for independence from Great Britain. These were people like Thomas Paine, uh, these are people like Lemuel Haynes, a young African-American combat veteran from the Battle of Ticonderoga. But unfortunately, they couldn't make that happen. And they couldn't make it happen because people like Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson uh, believed that slavery was just too profitable. Uh, uh, it, it accrued too much profits to, 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 to get shed of. Mexico, on the other hand, the very moment that the, the War of Independence breaks out in 1810, uh, becomes a war against slavery, uh, becomes a war against caste discrimination against indigenous people. And 
I want to, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but this is a, uh, this is really a sacred document. This is the first uh, uh, const kind of iteration of what becomes the Mexican Constitution, an end to slavery and discrimination based on castes. Torture shall not be permitted. And this was so important because Europeans used devices of torture to terrorize uh, enslaved Africans and indigenous peoples. And they begin in the Middle Passage and the slave trade, you know, using these terrible uh, implements of torture. Uh, and then they use them on indigenous peoples and, and African peoples when they, uh, in, in the Americas. Um, the other great thing about the Mexican constitution before we kind of move forward to think about is this. The Mexican constitution in its, in, in its subsequent iteration especially in the wake of the 20th century revolution, establishes the equality of women. It establishes the equality of working class people. And it develops, though, from the very outset, a important tradition of non-intervention. And those of us thinking about, you know, the importance of celebrating Latinx uh, uh, month or, or cultural heritage month, um, we need to remember that that the U.S. Constitution is faulty in the sense that we have been at war almost every year of this country's existence, uh, talking about the United States. Mexico, on the other hand, has a constitution and has a history of non-intervention. So if I asked you how many nations has Mexico carpet bombed or invaded, um, you would probably say, well, I don't think they have, right? And I would, I would respond, that's true. Um, so there are many things that we in the United States have to learn from Mexican constitutional traditions. I mentioned the public arts tradition in Mexico, and uh, these are two of the greatest uh, murals. You'll, you'll see these in public. Um, you can, if you, those of you who've been lucky enough to be able to um, go to Mexico City, uh, you'll see that that tradition uh, public arts um, is very prominent, and it's very prominent because in the years after the Mexican Revolution of the 20th century, the idea was to tell the history of our peoples in public so that we wouldn't forget where we came from. We wouldn't forget the brutality visited upon us, you see in the lower right-hand side, um, Native people literally being burned to death because they will not tell the Europeans where the gold is hidden, right? Uh, you'll see in the left, uh, enslaved Africans being branded and brutally treated uh, in slavery. But here you see the foundation of the resistance as well, the refusal to quit. That's what our ancestors really taught us. No matter how badly we were treated, we were going to survive. And, and it's that gift of survival, uh, which we owe to, to the fact that we're here um, this evening. There's a lot of moments of amazing contingency and possibility um, in the early part of the Mexican War of Independence. Jose Maria Morelos, a former uh, Catholic Christian priest, writes to President James Madison. And he asks James Madison, he says, you know, we could form the Mexican people and the American people could form this incredible alliance against the Europeans. Please help us. We're fighting for our liberty the same way you fought for your liberty against the British. And this is such an amazing, you know, this, when I read this letter, I first read this in Spanish, uh, looking at the correspondence of James Madison, uh, President Madison. Uh, you know, I, I cried actually when I read this because I realized that this was a moment of tremendous possibility. Imagine how different history could have been if President Madison would have responded in, in, uh, positively. But unfortunately, the United States was too heavily invested in slavery. Uh, and so that sets the U.S. Uh, on a collision course with Mexico, and it will drive the U.S. invasion of Mexico. Um, and I talk about the U.S. invasion of Mexico in the middle of my book. It's not the Mexican-American War. That's one of the worst nomenclatures. Uh, it's offensive, frankly. Uh, you know, as a third generation, you know, military veteran, I just can't believe I'd ever use that term. The U.S. invaded Mexico to reimpose slavery because Mexico had abolished slavery and thousands of African Americans found sanctuary in Mexico uh, in freedom uh, if they could just make it away from slavery in Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, and other places. 
kind of working towards a wrapping up. Um, this is really the centerpiece of the book, and I'm not going to read this whole quote, but this is Frederick Douglass. And I'll, I'll let you have a chance to kind of look at this. And I, I marvel every time I read this sentence. And this is one sentence, y'all. This, and this is how Frederick Douglass spoke. We unfortunately do not have a record of him uh, speaking. But we know by all accounts that he was an astonishing speaker. He kept his audience on their toes. He angered people. He, he, people would throw things at him when he was talking because he was breaking down the truth. Uh, he was like a prophet Jeremiah. He was the prophet Jeremiah of his time. And you see in the early 1800s, the radical abolitionists, and when you think of abolitionists, we think of black and white people, but it's Hispanic Latinx Heritage Month, month y'all. If you read Spanish, you know, and you go into the archives and the documents that Mexicans are the leading abolitionists of their time. And you know that Mexican Americans who live in places like California, Arizona, actually have Spanish language abolitionist uh, editorials all the time. They're writing against slavery and they're opposed to US colonialism and US advance across the continent. And they're equally opposed to slavery because they understand that slavery is driving manifest destiny. But here, Frederick Douglass is reminding us that the U.S. brought the Civil War on itself. And remember, up to this point, this is the bloodiest civil war in human history. We're, we still haven't recovered from it, right? And Douglass is trying to explain to this big audience in Philadelphia that we brought it on ourselves. And what he's saying is Americans need to look in the mirror. And instead of blaming our problems, and in this case, uh, he had a Northern audience. And if I could set the scene for you a little bit, he's telling his Northern audience, um, don't feel good that you're fighting the Civil War against the Confederacy. Uh, you need to face the fact that you are just as complicit with supporting and, and, and financing and expanding slavery as your Southern counterparts. Remember, you attacked the Native Americans. You invaded Mexico. You annexed Texas. You supported the slave trade. Um, you refused to recognize Haiti and Liberia. You refused to extend diplomatic recognition to the independent nations of the South. Um, and you did everything you could to placate slavery and to support it. And so now you're wondering why you had this terrible civil war. This place is imperialism and the struggle against imperialism really at the center of American history. But I want us to think about how African American thinkers of the 19th century were thinking a lot about Latin America. They were thinking a lot about Mexico, a lot about Cuba. Um, I want to connect this to the greatest thinkers of Europe. And those of you who know um, of the history of the Holocaust will know who Dr. Hannah Arendt was. She was one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century. Um, Again, I won't read this entire quote, but she's telling us uh, the bloody history that leads up to the Holocaust, and she's connecting it to slavery. She's connecting it to colonialism. She's connecting it to imperialism, and she's saying that the, the colonial uh, officials who went forth from Europe to conquer and dominate in India and Africa and Asia um, these are the ones who adopted behaviors which later became Nazism. And so she's connecting the, the brutal colonial, the histories of colonialism to the rise um, of Nazism and the, the, the terrible anti-Semitic uh, uh, hatreds that um, are also connected to colonialism um, as well. I mentioned this proud Mexican-Mexican-American uh, tradition of abolitionism. Uh, on the right-hand side, you have Frederick Douglass, uh, who frequently gave major props to, to Mexico for abolishing slavery. On the left, Francisco P. Ramirez, one of the great Hispanic abolitionists, um, a newspaper editor. Uh, one of the wonderful things, if you're a teacher, um, these newspapers are publicly available now. Um, uh, his original columns were written in Spanish. Uh, some of them have been translated into English now, uh, but they're actually available through university libraries. 
Um, and one of the exciting things to share with you is that many school districts across this country now are actually spending a lot of time revising and changing their curriculums, uh, their history lesson plans or social studies plans to make history more inclusive. The state of Connecticut, for example, just passed a law that says all students in Connecticut who graduate from a public uh, high school will take Latinx, African American, and Puerto Rican history, not as a um, extracurricular activity, not as an elective, but as a requirement. And I've been working with the state of Connecticut uh, on this new curriculum. That's so exciting to think about how we can uh, begin to have a much more inclusive history. And you know who's driving it? High school stu uh, students, high school parents, teachers, community members demanding a more inclusive history. And really the big driver right now is the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, it, the Black Lives Matter movement has made it, uh, has created this incredible excitement and explosion of interest in Latino history, uh, in Latinx history. How do I know this? Because I have like three times as many uh, Hispanic Heritage Month uh, events with high schools, community groups, uh, museums like this tonight. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement has really benefited all of us because it's really put a spotlight on American history and it's opened new, new venues to talk about building a more inclusive history. Um, I wanna work towards a conclusion here. Uh, thank you for being such a patient audience, but I want to dial us into a really incredible moment in 1928. And it's the National NAACP um, convention. It's held in Los Angeles, the, of course, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the founders, is talking about why Black people are fighting for the right, fighting to reestablish the right to vote, because it's been stolen from them, right? And so the 20s is the beginning of this upsurge of freedom struggle. And people ask, uh, are asking Dr. Du Bois, why should the Negro fight for his or her right to vote again. Um, uh, and, and Dr. Du Bois responds by saying, uh, we need to fight to regain the right to vote because we need to fight corruption in this country. And the stealing of the ballot, the creation of the one party state of white supremacy made this country so corrupt, so unbalanced, so vicious. And he says here that we have a responsibility to deal with the problem of imperialism and the, the emancipation of Haiti. By the way, the U.S. is currently occupying Haiti in 1928, by the way. Um, and Du Bois connects the struggle to regain the right to vote at home with the struggle against imperialism abroad. I call this the tradition of emancipatory internationalism. And it's one of the most precious tr traditions that we have in our collective histories, uh, which is that um, I may think I'm free, but if my neighbor isn't free, then my thinking I'm free is a complete illusion, right? We're only as free as the people around us. And that is the greatest freedom tradition that we have to, to really um, treasure. Um, I'll finish here. The um, African Americans, when they gain their, earn their emancipation in, in, in 1865, the first thing they do is they realize that emancipation in one country is not going to be enough. Um, and the great abolitionists, people like Henry Highland Garnett, people like uh, uh, Frederick Douglass, say to themselves and to others, the struggle against slavery has just begun, brothers and sisters. Uh, if we celebrate in the United States, and it's good to celebrate, we've come through centuries of, of fire and bondage, but what about our brothers and sisters in Cuba? What about our brothers and sisters in Brazil? Uh, what about Russian serfdom? And these were things that, and, and writing this book was a humbling experience because um, I had never thought about reconstruction in an international context, but that's the whole, that becomes the whole argument of the book. Everything that happens in the US is really happens with an international context. This is an extended argument against white nationalism in other words. Um, and so African Americans create a number of organizations to promote the anti-slavery struggle internationally. 
And one of them is the Cuban Anti-Slavery Committee, uh, which people like Henry Garnett, Scott Wren, who's a major black leader, and Douglas and others uh, promote and support. And by the way, at this meeting, there's so much drama. This is chapter four of my book. There's so much drama because the, the, um, the Spanish Empire uh, secret police uh, and spies come and try to break up this meeting that occurs at Cooper Institute. And the black leaders who are leading the meeting just kind of look at these, uh, at these guys and, and they're Spanish uh, agents and they have these pamphlets saying, you know, these Negroes, don't listen to these Negroes, they don't know anything. Um, uh, Cuba is a paradise. You know, we have wonderful race relations, right? Um, but people on the platform like Henry Garnett are like, no, uh, we need to end slavery there now. We need to support the Cuban people. Um, I'll conclude on the, the very last slide. I learned a new way to look at U.S. history uh, in researching this book. And um, I already knew the way the New York Times views Latin America and views us. I already knew the way the Washington Post views us historically. But this is from black newspapers. A lot of my research was from, the, from what was then called the Negro Press. And in the New York Times, Augusto Sandino and people who fought for their freedom and fought against US interventions were seen as bandits, were seen as thugs, you know, were seen as uh, criminals. But in black newspapers, Augusto Sandino was seen as a hero. And for me, this was a big wake up call because when I went to the Central America in a sol as a soldier in US Special Forces, uh, we had a very dim view of Augusto Sandino, even though he'd been dead for many years. But I really learned the truth about Latin America initially reading black newspapers from the 1920s. So I will conclude on that point. Um, thank you for your patience. Um, I know I've been talking a lot. Uh, let me get off uh, the screen share. And, and Michelle, I understand, uh, Dr. Tovar, you um, uh, would like me to answer a few questions. Um, yes, uh, okay. We have a question. Um, someone asking about uh, Sephardic settlers in Mexico uh, with the treatment of indigenous people and slaves. The question is, how could we have fled religious persecution and then not grant basic civil rights for those we encountered? Right. Our histories are very complicated, right? And so there, is, I mentioned in the Mexican War of Independence uh, in the 1810s, a, a, an early goal was to abolish the history of caste discrimination. But the Spanish Empire was based upon two things, anti-Semitism and racism. And the Spanish brought those cultures of oppression with them to the Americas. And it's important to understand we're still trying to break free of those, right? Um, that was part of the history of Cuba in the 1700s, 1800s. It was part of the history of Mexico in the 1700s and the 1800s. And we broke away from part of it but we're never able to, I mean, we're still grappling with anti-Semitism and racism, right? All throughout this, this hemisphere. But it's important to understand as my colleagues like uh, Lily Aguera, uh, a great Cubanist uh, who teaches at the University of Florida, just gave one of my uh, courses a great lecture on the rise of anti-Semitism uh, on the Iberian Peninsula in the 1100s and 1200s. Remember that the Spanish Empire, uh, uh, the kingdoms congeal, they come together in 1492 based upon anti-Semitism, based upon anti-Muslim uh, racism against the, the, the Moors. And so those, I mean, trying to square those things is trying to understand our, our kind of tangled up histories. Um, and, and we still have a long ways to go. Okay, one of the next questions we have here is how do you respond to the thought of people working to enter the US to find a better life in modern times when formerly enslaved people were working to enter Mexico to flee the US? How do we grapple with this? I have been very public um, about my support for amnesty for uh, so-called undoc undocumented workers. Uh, my people came here as refugees. We did not come here legally in 1914. Uh, and my great grandmother only applied for U.S. citizenship towards the very, very end of her life. Uh, and so I would be a hypocrite uh, if, if I turned my back on brothers and sisters fleeing persecution. Um, and, and let me be clear on this. Um, uh, my, one of my elders and guides, Juan Gonzalez, has written an incredible book called Harvest of Empire. 
many people come to countries like France or Great Britain or the United States because of unequal trade agreements, because those former colonial countries still tr uh, trade unequally uh, with their former colonized regions. What I mean by this is, and just kind of a, a bridge version, look at what the North American Free Trade Agreement did to small farmers in Mexico. It devastated the Mexican countryside. And so hundreds of thousands of small farmers in Mexico, uh, especially working in grains and corns and things like that, were wiped out, had no option but to leave the country and, and to come to the United States. Um, you know, I'm also a supervisor. I'm also an employer, right? I'm, I'm a boss. I run a university research center. And I can tell you that the University of Florida could not run without the labor of, of immigrant workers. Some of them are undocumented, right? But they're the ones that built the chemistry building across from my building right now. They're the ones that built this building here. So how dare us, uh, who are we to deny these people citizenship? Um, so th that's kind of my stance. Uh, and, and I know it, it could be controversial in some, in some areas. Um, but, you know, if you think of the struggles of enslaved Africans, and again, I want to highlight what the question, you know, it's a very important question because part of the question is getting us to remember that Mexico provided sanctuary, uh, not only for enslaved African Americans, but for people like, say, Jose Marti from Cuba. Um, if you go to Mexico City, you actually can visit um, the apartment where Jose Marti actually found sanctuary after he was ejected from Cuba by the Spanish. Okay, we have another uh, question here. Language is always evolving. Concerning the recent move to Latinx, um, this person is saying, I think the fact that we have been having the conversation about what we call ourselves for decades is proof that we have uh, our colonized people that have had our history and identity stripped from us. If we always get stuck on what to call ourselves, will we never get to the part where we organize and claim to the power in numbers? What's your take, Dr. Ortiz? It's so important. It, it's one of the exciting things about this, this month is um, I'm speaking at events all across the country, from Miami, Florida, to the Bronx, to Seattle, to Los Angeles, where I was last night, actually virtually. Um, and what we're calling ourselves, as the question points out, is always in motion. It's always in flux, right? Um, when I was a kid, uh, the term Chicana, and I was born in 1964, right? Uh, I'm relatively an old man now. Um, but when I was a kid, I'm, I'm just old enough to remember when the term Chicano was really edgy. I remember a lot of adults saying, don't call me a Chicano. I am a Mexicano, I'm an Hispano, I'm, I'm a Mexican, or, you know, anything but that. When I moved to Florida, the term, and I moved, my wife and I moved, and, and son moved in uh, 2008, the term Hispanic down here is very popular. And a lot of people would tell me, oh, why don't you call yourself Hispanic? And I said, look, where I come from, you don't use that term. Uh, I grew up primarily in the Northwest. But now I'm a guest and a, and a visitor to so many incredible community celebrations like the one tonight. So tonight we're using the term Latinx. But when I do events in, Flor in, in La Florida, uh, if you will, um, it's still very much Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, when I go to the Bronx, and I'm invited by Puerto Rican organizations, Boricuanga Bor uh, uh, organizations, I respect their traditions. So I, I was taught by my elders to, to not try to impose my uh, terminologies on others, but as a guest, as a visitor, to respect those traditions. So um, I think it's a very important discussion, um, but what I'm interested in too is, uh, you know, treat us, and treat others with dignity, with, 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 with respect. Um, I picked the title, you know, African American Latinx History of the United States. Um, that wasn't the original title. I mean, I was, I was sold with using uh, Latina and, and, and Latino. But my students at that time, and the title I think was picked in 2016, my students were saying, you know, Professor Ortiz, we're kind of looking at you. We want you to, to give us an inclusive and inclusivity and you talk about inclusivity in your classrooms, um, we, we want to see it manifested in the book, right? Um, I knew there'd be controversy, and I think the controversy is good, because again, how, who, how we call each other, what we call each other is very important. I want to learn 
you know, what do you want to want me to call you? And I'm going to respect that, right? I'm not going to try to impose my ideas because that is what colonialism did to us. Um, it really robbed us of our indigenous, our African, uh, and our mixed ancestries. And that's the thing I want to, to emphasize. Um, you know, think about Antonio Maceo, one of the greatest revolutionary gener uh, generals in the history of the Americas, a Cuban freedom fighter who died in the 1890s fighting Spanish imperialism. African Americans loved General Maceo, even though they had never seen him, you know, uh, they had never heard him speak, but they loved him because of his mixed race identity. They didn't see being biracial or triracial as a weakness. They loved General Maceo because he was a mix of indigenous and Hispanic uh, and African, and he owned those things, right? The Mexican War of Independence, uh, here's a little secret, y'all. I'll tell you why the Mexican War of Independence succeeded against the Spanish, because many of the leaders were triracial. They were, Me they, they were African, indigenous, and European descent peoples, and they weren't ashamed of that. They were proud of that, and they didn't try to make up some kind of colorblind nonsense, right? You know, oh, I don't see color. You know, Vicente Guerrero actually spoke indigenous languages, and that allowed him to recruit indigenous people into the armies of liberation. And so we need to be proud of those, those, those different identities um, because we all, you know, kind of paraphrase um, Amy Cesaire, there's room for all at the rendezvous of victory. Dr. Paul Ortiz, gracias. Um, I have a toddler in the background that's kind of losing it on this point. But thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. And our viewers, thank you for joining us. Our next lecture featuring Dr. Laura Lamonic, author of Cugos and Frijoles, Latino Jews in the United States, will be held next week, September 24th at 6 p.m. Central Time Zone. You can register at our website, hmh.org. Please feel free to follow us also on Instagram at Boniac Center and at HMHOU. Thanks again for tuning in. Thank you again. Muchas gracias, Dr. Ortiz, for this beautiful, fantastic, not performance, presentation. Thank you. Have a great evening, everyone. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Be safe, everyone. Help each other out. Okay? Thank you so much.